episode number 25 of The Witching Hour. I am Perry Nemroff, and that's Haley Fouch. Hi. My wonderful co-host, my favorite friend. She's wonderful. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing... touched. <laughs> um, I mean it. Seriously, I mean it. And I'm just going to let it sink in a little more. Oh, thank One you, of the darling. reasons that I'm so thankful that I moved to L.A. is because this wonderful friend was here waiting for me. And oh. she is a special person. And you should all know that if you don't already. But thank we also have a very special lineup we today. We do. We have a big lineup. Okay. So before we dig into the first story, I'll give you a little recap what we're going to do. We're going to talk about Channel Zero, a discovery of which is you and glass. Yes. So I'll just put out there, one of the reasons why Haley is awesome is because she always gives me good suggestions for <laughs> things to watch. So she wanted me to watch you, but she also told me at a point in time, and I didn't listen, to watch Killing Eve. And oh. part of the reason why I didn't finish you is because I happen to have also restarted <laughs> Killing Eve. And if you watch that show, you know once you start it, you can't put it down. So I keep like yeah. ping ponging back and forth between the two of them. Those but I'm gonna would finish be both. Hard to watch together because they're both very compulsive viewing. Oh my god, it it's it's been a problem. And yeah. then on top of that, Oscar nominations coming yes. out, prepping for Sundance and doing all the work for that. It's been a very busy week of wonderful things. But first, we're gonna hit our first item now. Channel Zero. Do you want to say what happened? Because I don't know if I could utter the words. Well, they did it. Those sons of guns did it. Sci-fi canceled. You can say the B word on our show. <laughs> Those sons of bitches Those did it. Those sons of bitches did it. They canceled Channel Zero. They broke our hearts. We kind of had I'm talked so about upset. how we thought it might be coming. Uh, but it doesn't make it easier when it does happen. It doesn't. That's, um, I don't get it. I guess the numbers just weren't there, and I'm hoping, I, I think we've mentioned this before, my big hope is that it performs really well on Shudder, and mm -hmm. that Shudder will want to save it, because it's the creativity, creativity in it is too good to just be gone. That's the thing. It's... It's so good. Mm. I feel like I always have my work cut out for me when I'm trying to get somebody out there to watch horror content that isn't necessarily open to the genre like we are. And with Channel Zero, that's one of the very few properties in the television format that I can wholeheartedly, fully, confidently say to someone, even if horror isn't your thing, this is a high quality show that is going to get you no matter what. Yeah. And now, no. No more. But on the bright side, the show did go four for four. That's it, right. It is quite nice to have a complete series that is at a certain level, if not above it, every single episode. It's true. And that's not maybe a show I would have expected to even last four seasons yeah. on most networks. I was kind of hoping that, I know Shudder has the streaming rights yes. to, what is it, the first three seasons, or do they have four up already? They have four. I don't know if it's up or if it's about to be up, but they have it. It even seems like an appropriate show for Netflix. And Netflix yeah. is just like spending money <laughs> like crazy. So why would, I mean, really, why wouldn't Netflix pick up this brilliant idea of a show that tackles a different creepypasta every season and yeah. start to make it themselves? I mean, I would love to see it there. And I think it really could thrive there, which is we're about to talk to you. That's a show that we'll get into mm -hmm. totally bombed out on network and is now a sensation on Netflix. <laughs> Someone, um, um, after Channel Zero got canceled on Twitter, sent me an image of something called Folklore. Is that a Netflix show? Folklore? Yeah. I, I don't know. Oh, that. no, it's HBO. It's HBO. Okay. It's coming up right now. And it's a, it's a horror anthology huh. that premieres in February. And it, it has not been on my radar at all. I was not Added aware of it. And list. they sent whoever you are out there. I'm sorry I don't know you by name or Twitter handle, but thank you for sending me that because it did make me feel a little bit better. But I was just wondering if that being on Netflix could have, you know, posed an even bigger conflict for Channel Zero moving over there. But one way or the other, I just hope someone out there saves it because yeah. it is a show so well worth saving. It's it really is and. I, I guess that Netflix is more or less probably out of the question now that Shudder holds the streaming this rights. This is an old show. Is it? Yeah. It says, it says 2008. Because I just, I happen to just notice, or maybe it's, yeah, it says 2008. I can't find the air dates right now, but maybe <laughs> uh, it is old. Maybe I should go back and rewatch it to fill the Channel Zero void anyway. 
No, this looks new. Really? Uh, EW, this broke yesterday, it looks like. EW can exclusively review then reveal that a new horror anthology show called Folklore will premiere on February 1st. Oddly enough, I'm on a Wikipedia page right now that said Folklore is a television horror anthology series slated to premiere on HBO Asia in 2008. So maybe it did well in Asia and maybe they're is. trying to do a, a, an American-based uh, remake no, this reboot. Is, this is Asian. It says Folklore is a six-episode hour-long series that takes place across six Asian countries. According to this Wikipedia page, those episodes aired from October 7th, 2018 to November 11th, 2018. Oh, 2018. I could see that happening. That's uh, We're also about to talk to about A Discovery of Witches, which aired in the UK last yeah. year. And so I guess that's yeah. possible. I'm that's still looking cool. forward to it one way or the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's where we stand on Channel Zero. We've yeah. spoken about it a lot on The Witching Hour. But just in case you happen to have missed any of those episodes, go watch it. Go, go watch it on Shudder. One, Shudder is a subscription that if you're a genre fan and if you are a genre fan and listening, you, you are likely a genre fan if you are listening to this <laughs> show. I highly recommend getting a Shutter subscription, yes. and then I highly recommend you using your time to catch up on Channel Zero. If you I just also want to say, I feel like we should clarify because we talk about it so much. We're not sponsored by Shutter. No. If we were, we disclose it. We just think it's a great use of your I, money. Like, I genuinely think yeah. that that is money well spent if you're looking for streaming services Likewise. to pick up. So, Haley, now it's yes. your turn. Tell me about this a discovery of witches. Well, speaking on of Shutter, <laughs> yeah, uh, it is a. Uh, co-production I believe it's on Shudder and it's on Sundance now and it's um it's based on a very popular book trilogy by I believe her name is Deborah Harkness I hope I got that right I know she has really intense fans um I haven't read the books so I went in fairly blind and it's just it's like a really swoony romantic paranormal it gets called Twilight for adults a lot, which I can mm. see, but I think is a little uh, more diminutive Ooh, than it Matthew deserves. Matthew Good. Now that's what I was going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I got distracted. Matthew Good is like one of those actors that no matter what he's in, he's fantastic. And you always, you have that reaction. Yeah. Oh, Matthew Good. Yes, <laughs> please. And he's serving very sexy vampire vibes in this, which... Okay. Like, if you liked what he was serving in Stoker, but was like, what if he wasn't a total psychopath? That's really appealing. It's good. And I love Teresa Palmer. It's yeah, cool she, to see her take on a leading role like this. She's great. I feel like she hasn't been in the spotlight quite yeah. as much as she deserves to. Because I've seen some, you know, so-so movies with her in it. Yes. And I feel like that has kind of, you know, not propelled her to stardom in the way that she she's very capable of achieving. Absolutely agree. I, I think she's wonderful. And I like her. She... I think she's got to do a lot of her best work in Australian film, which makes sense. But uh, just to be brief about it, it, it stars Teresa Palmer as this w woman who is born of witches but does not herself exhibit powers mm -hmm. until she goes to the library one day and manages to summon somehow against her will this ancient book that all the creatures of the world really want to get their hands on. Enter sexy vampire man hmm. who like protects her from all the creatures that want the book that she found, and it's uh, it's a simple pleasure, man. It is a swooning romance. I'm into it. I watched it all like on a hungover day, just like yes, take me away. I feel like when I get back from Sundance, I am going to need something like a full <laughs> yeah. weekend of not leaving my couch. So it's I will perfect. finish you killing Eve, and I will likely start that show too. Uh, yeah, just a discovery of witches is an interesting one to watch with you because they're both like sweeping romance stories oh from boy. completely different perspectives. I have so much to say <laughs> about that topic. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we jump into the main, the main meat of the day? Yeah, I guess I'll just say it's like, it's a really well executed show. It's a beautifully shot show. It mm. is, like I said, a simple pleasure. It's a swooning ram romance. If you're not into paranormal romance, it's probably not going to be for you. If you like that stuff, tally ho, because it's right there. I don't think but, I fall into one category or the other, yeah. but the rest of the pitch was working for me. <laughs> if, if you, um, you know, so if you're down with that kind of thing, this is a really well-made version of it. And it's, you know, it's got beautiful locations in England and France mm -hmm. and um, oh, it's a global the East show. Coast. Yes. Cool. Yeah. So that's my, my last thing is it is actually is quite beautiful to watch. Sold. Yay. Sold. We will circle back <laughs> when I watch that. Um, 
Now we're going to jump into the show You, which is currently yeah. streaming on Netflix, but it didn't start over there. No. Do you know the history of the show? A bit, yeah. It uh, It's based also on a very popular book. Um, I don't know the author of that one, though, sorry. It went to Lifetime, of all places, which is why I admittedly and shamefully kind of wrote it off, which I totally admit is a bad thing to do. And then it's went to Netflix as many shows do to stream, but it also, Netflix will exclusively de debut the second season. So it is now a Netflix show. Oh, there's a season two. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, good. Yeah. Good, because I am officially seven episodes in. So there's your spoiler warning for this section of the show. Okay. I mean, we'll start, let's start by giving some non-spoiler thoughts, just in case anybody out there is wondering if they should spend their time watching you, but then we'll jump into it with seven episodes worth of spoilers. So I guess just briefly, what the show is about is you have this guy, Joel Goldberg, and a woman catches his eye, Guinevere Beck, and he quickly becomes obsessed with her and uses the wonderful tools of the internet to essentially stalk her yeah. and oh, then not manipulate definitely. Yeah, and then <laughs> manipulate their relationship based on this information that he gets on oh. her. And uh it's creepy. Penn Badgley is creepy. Uh, yeah. My non-spoiler thoughts are, I love it. Yeah. I love, love, love it. You were definitely right in saying that this and Killing Eve are shows that once you start them, you can't put them down. Yeah. There's been a couple of nights over the past few days where it's in the middle of the night and I want to click next episode and I just have to get sleep for the next day. It's very difficult to turn off. The cliffhangers are great. So far up to episode seven, I think the show makes great use of its supporting characters in addition to keeping its spotlight on the two leads. Beck, so her name is Guinevere Beck. She goes by the name Beck. It took her a little longer to kind of grow on me. And I'm not saying that I think Joe has grown on me to the point that I'm rooting for him. We'll get into that a little bit more yeah. when we dig into spoilers. But I think Penn Badgley is pitch perfect He's in good. that role. I was having a little bit of a tough time with her. I was definitely focused on him more so for, I would say, the first three episodes. And then all of a sudden, there's a little shift that happens that kind of got me on board with her. But the two of them have turned out to be something else. And I think the supporting characters, in particular, Shane Mitchell from Pretty Little Liars, yeah. is a major standout. And actually, Lou Taylor Pucci as well <laughs> is something else on this show. But I'm going to leave it at that. I highly recommend checking this out if you like... Uh, you like a, a like a romantic fueled like sinister mystery that can really kind of like dig its claws in and get in your head in a way where it's difficult to shake and it'll make you think twice about using certain pieces of technology. <laughs> yeah, I have always been really paranoid about social media. Like, you know, my Facebook's on super private lockdown, mm -hmm. and I I just. It's taken me a long time to get this comfortable, and I'm not comfortable at all. Like, yeah. if you guys follow my Twitter, I tweet maybe once a week. This did nothing to help me with that. But I, I agree with your assessment of the show overall. I really love the most about it, not to repeat everything you just said, which I, I do agree with, so to say something else. I love that it is straddling so many genres in such a weird way. Like, when I, it was first recommended to me, I wasn't thinking of it as horror at all. And uh, that came slowly while watching yeah. the show because it is both romance and horror oh, and mystery is. in so many weird ways where you, you're you like in the romance even though you know it's terrible and shouldn't be happening. It's a problem. It, it challenges <laughs> your allegiances as a viewer. Like, why am I rooting for this? Am I? No, I'm not. But am I in my heart? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, it's a challenging one. So I love that. I love stories that swim between the lines of genre like this one does so elegantly and fun. Yeah. It, it's a, a very fun watch, a very good use of the F word. And yeah. also the other F word, I would say it's a, it's a really engaging mind fuck. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. it, I am hot. I find it highly enjoyable and also highly stressful watching the show mm -hmm. for so many reasons. Well, I, keep, I just think Pedge, Penn Badgley was perfectly cast. And I don't know if you were ever watched Gossip Girl. Uh, oh, I watched <laughs> Gossip Girl. I watched a lot of Gossip Girl. I think it is such 
a fantastic spin on that type of like nice guy character yeah. he played in Gossip Girl, who wasn't a nice guy in that show, by the way, either. Not really. No, but this is a perfect dissection of that sort of mindset mm -hmm. of like, I know what's best for you. I know what's best for everyone. I'll take care of you. It really is. Before we get into spoilers, just the flip side is I'm not saying that this is a flawless show. And I no. think uh, I'm. I do wonder if, let's say, I could go back in time and extract the knowledge that this was once on Lifetime. I wonder mm -hmm. if my feelings would have been a little different, but there are points in this show where it does wind up right in line with what I traditionally know a Lifetime movie to tend to be. And I would say that in how it plays, it plays into, you know, romantic melodrama a little oh bit. Oh gosh, yes. I, it is a very melodramatic show. Again, highly entertaining. And if that's the case, I think melodrama is totally fine. But if you are someone who will scoff at a Lifetime movie or a typical Lifetime movie, I think there are hints of that here. So don't go in thinking it's it's completely not that at all. I think it's intentionally that in a w yeah. in the way that it's dissecting all of those fantasies. Mm -hmm. Like it it both is like I said it makes you invest and makes you go whoa what am I rooting for here because it it effectively channels all of that romantic melodrama that we're used to getting and puts you in that kind of a story but then slices everything in half and goes here's why that's all really ugly. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's like a rubber band. Like, it snaps every single time yeah. I think it's dipping too far into that. It'll snap right back. Right. Or at least subvert whatever expectation I started to formulate. Yeah. So I applaud it for that. It's, I think it's very clever. And um, it definitely is, again, it's like with the discovery of witches things. Like, if you hate paranormal romances, you're not going to like that show. If you hate romance stories... Mm -hmm. You're probably not going to like this one because it is, it is a dis deconstruction of the romance story, but built around the romance story. I guess so. That's the framing of it. I do think that this is a show that has something to offer for so many different types of tastes, though. Like yeah. It's got the horror element. It's got the romance element. And then it's also just how it plays into the idea of like who millennials are hmm. and, you know, how we've basically grown to have a phone as another appendage, you know? And I feel like, I, I don't want to make any generalizations here, but as, as an individual who has grown up with all this technology as a firm part of my life, it doesn't matter whether a specific movie or show is in one of my favorite genres. If you incorporate that element, there will be an immediate connection and I'll likely want to see that story unfold. Yeah, I get that. Like I said, this this is a a story that just really jumps through genres very easily. Mm -hmm. But I do. I think maybe I'm wrong. I think if you're the type of person who's like, oh, I hate romance, then you probably won't enjoy watching this as much because a lot of it is. Oh yeah, that's romance. For sure. Yeah, a lot of it is. It's um, like getting swoony swept off your feet and then going. Oh my God, put me down. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good way to describe it. Okay, spoilers. Okay, I spoilers. want to get into spoilers Let's so bad. So again, this is your spoiler warning. We, I have seen up to seven episodes. Yeah, I'm episode Haley has seven seen right now. I'll, I'll tell you where that one ends, <laughs> okay. just to put a, a fine line on it, because cool. I don't, I obviously don't want to be spoiled because yes. I'm super engaged right now. <laughs> um, I actually can't wait to go home tonight and to watch more. Yes. I should, uh, I should be prepping for more Sundance interviews, but instead, I, ha I have to finish before I go, or I'm gonna lose my mind um we're gonna talk up to episode seven with spoilers this is your warning the cutoff is happening right now because i'm gonna tell you exactly where spoilers. i left off after i finish the sentence period okay so i am up to the episode after peach's demise okay. so peaches died in episode six and i have watched episode seven okay gotcha and i put the emphasis on episode six because that is my favorite episode. It is. Holy <laughs> shit. Talk about a great performance from Penn Badgley where he is trying to maintain everything he's established with Joe in terms of one, his love for Beck, two, that sinister nature we ha where he has to spy every minute. And then also he is suffering from a major head injury. Yeah. He can't like, he can't even stay on his feet. And I thought he played into one, the heart 
horror, but also the co- the physical comedy of that so well. And the script does too. The script, the way it works in what he's saying out loud and then what's going through his head as he's creeping around the Salinger mansion. I thought that was pure genius. It's a fantastic episode. It marks, I think it's really cool how this uh, show kind of goes through three shifts almost. Okay. Like the first one I think is what you were referring to when you finally get in Beck's head a yes, little bit. I needed that. That's a major shift for the show. Episode six is a major shift because uh, episode after Peach's demise as he's so... The party. Yes. We, we then find out that they've broken up, you know, a major shift for the show again. And And he seems okay with it. Yeah. I was so surprised. (laughs) Uh, That's just really, that really just like put my expectations and ideas and and plans for the future of the show like in the trash. Well, I think that's what it does every few episodes. Everything I thought the show was going to be, it was in its first two episodes. Yeah. And then it continued to become something else every few episodes. What a messed up first episode. Yeah. What what a messed up concept that seems so disturbingly realistic. How easy is it to do that to somebody? Somebody who is not watching out for their online security. Yeah. Real oh. easy, I think. It drives me nuts. I really <laughs> I like I couldn't I couldn't shake that first episode for a little. I I had to so I didn't go straight into watching episode 1 right into 2 cuz I yeah. had to kind of had to kind of pause for a minute Mm -hmm. and think about it. Well, I do have one helpful piece of advice that I need to take myself and do a refresh on. But you know those websites that he uses to, like, find all her information, like where she lives and everything? You can get yourself removed. You just have to go website by website and request that you take down your information. I did it a few years ago. I need to go do it again now. Yeah, yeah. um, Okay. That's my pro tip for anyone who's a little paranoid about online security. I need you to walk me through that. It's a lot because there are, like, a thousand of those websites. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's tons. I think it was more of a winning battle five years ago than it is now, probably. probably. But I, uh, I would imagine that. Yeah, that's, uh, again, a big paranoia of mine. So seeing it so effectively used in the show. They do it really well, too, with... I feel like sometimes having, you know, texting and emailing on camera gets the eye roll yeah. out of me often True. where it's never done in a way that feels super realistic it's almost just you know designed to look visually appealing within the screen which i think has a valid case for going that approach in some movies but it all feels so real here like exactly when they use their phone exactly when the lighting is the lighting from the phone <laughs> even and it just enhances the story overall and he just, he really hooked me, Penn Badgley, with his performance in that first episode. And that's where I started to feel the conflict. And that's when I thought, I just, I again, this is another example of when I was expecting one thing and it completely changed. I thought it was going to work for a little while and then it was going to dissipate. But he had me so hooked and oddly enough rooting for him in certain moments when what he was doing is it's not just wrong, it's vile and yeah. evil. And the way this character plays with my emotions is <laughs> yeah. so frustrating. That's what I mean about the weird allegiances where you, you just like, you catch yourself over and over and over Why? again. Why? Why do I do that? I mean, <laughs> including what he's doing to Beck. And then as an example of one of the other uh, facets of that character, his relationship with Paco. Yeah. That's the way you toy with your audience in a way that isn't isn't even manipulative, but well developed. It's it's not manipulative, but I also don't think it's what a lot of us take it to be on the surface. It's not affection. It's grooming, you know sociopaths like which that. is something that's on my mind while i'm watching it yeah. but i can't i can't separate the two i know it's it's very disturbing because paco needs him yeah no I he mean, does until he doesn't at least he needs serious government intervention and we're rooting for him to stay with his mother but that's clearly the worst thing for him mm. so like i don't know this plays with our emotions in all the ways the funniest moment that i caught myself was when he was trying to knock out the guy's teeth and uh, he had to stop and throw up and come back to oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was, like, obviously horrified, but I was like, yeah, I bet that would be really hard. 
Like trying to knock out somebody's teeth would be a real challenge, Joe. <laughs> and the opportunity to get in his head too yeah. as he's going through things like that. And also I think another standout moment that has that same effect is when he hits Peach while she's running. <laughs> and and he just got I mean like he runs away yeah. like flailing I love that DNA is real (laughs) just going through his thought process and all the things he's worried about and even like a degree of of regret and remorse it's it's weird watching that character flip-flop between being I'm not a killer I like I'm not gonna do this and then being totally okay with thinking that he's doing the right thing for Beck's best interest Oh boy, the show is exhausting in the best way possible. It really is. It's, uh, yeah, I'm glad that you you decided to watch it. I am so into it. And again, I think Shane Mitchell as Peach might be my favorite thing <laughs> so far. I she's think, so good in that role. She's great. And I think the Peach reveal is maybe my favorite reveal of that season is just yeah. that she's a fucking psycho too. Yeah. She, I love that. She's a psycho, and, and, you know, that is backed by so much honest chemistry. Yeah. Just that she exudes when she is with Beck. It's like the second they say it, I could never unsee that for <laughs> yeah. a minute. And, you know, she. it's a weird thing, again, where I was almost, like, rooting for her, and I, I feel for her when she can't have what she wants so desperately. I just think it's a testament to the show and how it, it investigates toxic relationships because that's what it's all about. It's about toxic friendships, toxic romance and all the things that we allow people to do to us because it's out of love or, you know, things like that. And that's, I mean, it's so good because that is sort of what it is to fall in love with a toxic person is to go, but, Oh, they only want the best for me. Oh, they only want the best for Beck. (laughs) And this is like a shining example of, wanting the best for someone and then going about it in the worst imaginable (laughs) way. Um, I also want to give another uh, performance shout out to uh, Lou Taylor Pucci, who crushes it (laughs) in what is it? He lasts two episodes. He kills him at the end of episode two. He's so good in that role. And I feel like it's been a little while since I've, you know, seen him be, not necessarily suave, but like the asshole boyfriend. He's Nor- so awful. You know, normally he is, he's like a, like a kinder character, yeah. but he plays into that so well. And I think I was most upset to see him killed off just because I wanted more of him on the show. But I think he, he really uses his screen time in those first two episodes in the most memorable way possible. Agreed. He's always, he's always a welcome presence in anything, I think. Agreed. And, uh, I also want to single out Hari Neff, who plays Blythe. Yes. Love. I Uh, feel like there's more to come for her, for me, based on where I am right now. But the few scenes she showed up in, she has popped quite well. I don't think that that character has as much to do as Peach or Joe or Lou Taylor Poochies. I can't remember his name right now. But uh, I just, I like her. Benji. Benji. Benji, that would thank you. Me. <laughs> I like her charisma in any scene that she's in. And I like that that character, I immediately was like, oh, I hate her. And mm-hmm. then I came around on. Yeah. I, also, I just discovered or like I'm way late to the Hari Neff party because I saw Assassination Nation really yeah. late. I just think she's great. I want to see her yeah. in everything. She she is someone who just really pops on yeah. screen no matter what she's doing. She's just got a very natural like charisma and a commanding presence yeah. that I'm really digging between this show and also Assassination Nation. But oh, I need to watch the end. Yeah, you do. I need you to do. watch more. Yeah, that's uh maybe we'll revisit this after you see the finale cuz I wouldn't mind. That's um, something to discuss. One question for you because I brought up that um Uh, I was having a little bit of a tough time with Beck at the very beginning. And I think that was kind of tipping the scale in Joe's direction, maybe more so than if I was, Mm -hmm. I I guess it it took me a little while to realize what was so special about her. Mm -hmm. There was, there was never, at least in the first episode, I had a very difficult time understanding why Joe was so into her and why he was willing to do so much for her, minus just from his perspective. Like I needed it to come from my my reaction to her yeah. more so than just me feeding off of Joe. 
if that I makes any sense. I think it's intentional. I think that it's very intentionally designed so that you first relate to Joe. Okay. Like, I think that's the whole magic trick of it. Okay. Is they hold her back and they make Joe your protagonist. He's the one that even though you, you shouldn't be, like we've said, you're kind of rooting for him at times when mm -hmm. you know it's wrong. And I think that Beck is meant to be sort of a challenging woman. She's like, uh, she's a bit of an exhibitionist. She's, um, she's, what's the word I'm looking for? She's very self-destructive. Mm -hmm. um, I think she's meant to be not, not the perfect person that Joe sees her as. Yeah. I think that's the point, I is mean, that he's yeah. delusional. It's like the, the whole point of her character is that you, you immediately look at her and you paint a certain picture about her and yeah. there's really so much more underneath. And as for like, you know, he doesn't fall in love with her because she's a great writer. He doesn't know that. All he yeah, knows yeah. is that he likes a book that she bought yeah. and that she's pretty and stuff like that. So that all comes, I think, later. And is, the, the trick of it is sort of to help you almost go from Joe being the protagonist to Beck being the protagonist. Hmm. I think that for me, eventually, I wasn't quite sure who was. I think I'm getting there because yeah. at the point that I'm at, I'm starting to see I'm starting to see change and growth in Beck. Yeah. Which I think is what the season narrative is trying to serve. Yeah, she's um but I do I I think that's intentional. I think that you're meant to f fall for Joe first, mm -hmm. fall under his spell first and then then it's Beck. Then it's the part where you go fully realize how much you've been taken in by the wrong character. Okay. It is weird. It's interesting. Like he's a full on, full on nasty, horrible person, and a lot of people have more problems with her. It's like I know that's not that's, what you're saying. No, but that I mean, it does. It, it scratched the surface yeah. in in terms of what I'm I'm getting at here, and it's like I'm able to process how wrong that is, yeah. and that that goes into like the mindfuck idea of the show. Yeah. That's why I think it's probably intentional. It's also, in looking at the show and how I'm responding to it, it's also an interesting assessment just in terms of how I as an individual respond to certain forms of entertainment, mm -hmm. where you could process one thing when you're seeing it in a TV show or on a movie screen, but in real life, it's something completely different. And I think this show is doing a really good job of kind of breaking down the wall between the two and like yeah. challenging me to, to really assess this pretty much in a different way where it's almost like even though it's it's melodramatic and very big and i i do think unrealistic in in certain totally. certain aspects it's also kind of breaking down that barrier between fantasy and reality in a way that i'm taking with me to a disturbing extent yeah i i love that uh pen badgley has been active on twitter and like has he really yeah people are like oh why why is joe so hot even though he's a killer and pen badgley's just like stop stop that huh? no he is a murderer stop it he is not here for the romanticizing of joe i feel like i need to scroll through it's that good feed now. <laughs> yeah i love that um have we missed anything oh i, I do really like her friends too speaking of characters that have mm. grown on me annika and lynn <laughs> annika in particular just because you know she was the first of the trio to really strike some sort of meaningful relationship with joe and then i i do really appreciate the conversations between him and lynn when he's planning the birthday party yeah i mean I, I like them. They don't have as much to do. Annika. Is that for us? Um, is that Joe at the door? We can I just keep talking. Truly hope not. Annika is funny to me. She I get more from her in the dynamic that we were discussing, like where it, it looks at technology and our mm -hmm. millennials in that age. I, yeah. I see her more as like a millennial comedy oh, point. Oh, yeah. That's definitely what that's tapping yeah. into. And just... You know, also seeing how she has this whole social media empire that could crumble at the drop of a hat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's really, that taps into the entire thing, too. How, you know, one teeny tiny piece of information or, or one, you know, moment of irresponsibility can land your phone in somebody else. That, like, really, I mean, not even just thinking about a stalker type situation like this where he snatches her phone. But, like, you leave your phone anywhere and 
all your stuff is on it. Yeah. It's all there. I know. Oh, it's it very stresses scary. me out. I am going to retire and move to a cabin in the woods and never log on the internet again. I am again. not going to do that. I'll just keep my <laughs> fingers crossed for a while. I'll just continue uh, tweeting about only movies and cats so nobody can get at me that way. There you go. <laughs> I am, you know what? People, people are weird. I find everything dangerous. Like, oh, she saw that movie at this time. Where? Where was that screening? Where could I be waiting? That uh, not to encourage that behavior. Don't fair do fair that, concern. But I feel like everything you post online probably, is dangerous. Yeah, probably a smart smart idea to have that in mind, no matter what yeah. you do online. Always thinking twice exactly about things. Exactly right. Uh, making sure you're playing safe. You're also being kind. That's always a nice hey, thing to remember yeah. uh, every once in a while, huh? I love kindness. Um, so there you go. That's our uh, our seven episode review of yeah. you. And when I get back from Sundance, I really do want to revisit this. It's because so fun. I want to get to the end and have a full-blown season one spoiler discussion. Do we know when season two is coming? No. Okay. Will, it's not something that's I like already in production or anything? I don't know if it, I, I have a feeling they won't want to wait long, especially on the heels of how yeah. it blew up to like supposedly 40 million viewers or something. Oh, is that the number they're yeah. saying after this one? Um, Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. So I don't think they'll wait very long. I don't know if it's already in production. We do know details about it that I won't tell you because you haven't seen the okay. end. Yes, please do. Not. Um, <laughs> so we'll save that for later. But yeah, I'm really glad that we got to talk about it. It's such a fun, sort of smart, sort of silly show. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a perfect binge watch. Yeah, highly recommend it as well. So the next big story in our episode today is we are going to talk spoilers. Yeah. For glass. Yeah. So this is your glass spoiler warning at this point. If you have not seen the movie and you don't want to know all the details, you should not be listening to this until <laughs> you see the film on the big screen. Definitely. Um, at this point, I've done the Collider spoiler review, okay. so everybody out there should generally know what I think. So Haley, you kick us off here. What do you think of glass? I have such a complicated relationship with glass at this point. Mm -hmm. I'll say my first reaction to it was just not good like disappointed bored dissatisfied dislike across the board but as soon as I walked out I was talking to my friend and I said I never want to see that again and I can't wait to watch it like mm. I I hated it but I was also very very interested in it and uh, the longer I think about it, the longer I sit with it, the more I respect it because it has this sort of like punk rock fuck you to it. Like, I'm not here to be the movie you want me to be. I'm here to I'm Shyamalan. I'm doing my thing. I don't care what you want out of your superhero movies. And I've come to respect that. So I'm... I can understand My that, relationship though. with the film is evolving at this point. Yeah. I did not enjoy watching it, but I sure have enjoyed thinking about it. I would say uh, the same to a degree in terms of, you know, my relationship with it evolving. And I hear a lot of people bringing up, you know, it, like, people don't like it because it wasn't what they wanted it to be. Yeah. And... I, in all honesty, I can't say I walked into that movie expecting or wanting any specific thing. I like I did feel like an especially blank slate walk <clears throat> excuse me, walking in where it's not like I didn't get the story that I wanted for yeah. these three characters, so I'm all mad about it. I was ready for whatever Shyamalan cooked up because I couldn't really put a finger on what direction it could even go in. So I'll give you, because I, I don't disagree with that. It's not like <laughs> I thought, I, I don't know. I didn't have any particular storyline in my head, but I'll give you some examples of like how I feel that it's actively yeah. not what the audience wanted or waited okay. for. Um, so first of all, the way he shoots everything is always keeping the action just off of frame. Yeah. Everything's denying you what you typically would see in that kind of film. When he, he'll cut like to a door instead of what's happening outside the door, or like yeah. the scene with the van where it goes inside, that's the closest there is to action, but even still you're missing most of it. Okay, the, and then, do you think that was a stylistic choice yes. or do you think that was a budget choice? At first I thought it was just an annoying choice but the more i think about it the more i think it was Sh Shyamalan basically being like that's not the mm -hmm. movie i'm making 
So one example of that that comes to mind that I don't necessarily know if it fits in, in that description of it is the water uh, sprays being used on Bruce Willis. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just I couldn't shake the feeling that he was just like, don't spray me with water. That's so totally possible. Or, or I didn't have enough yeah. time to do that that day or so. I don't know. I could see it, that. You know, again, that to me, just trying to read into it. I'm not saying, you know, so it was I'm just reading into yeah. it. Uh, what I read into all that stuff, and that's a great example that I definitely fits the, I definitely think fits the bill mm -hmm. of denying you what you are expecting or want to see. Or, I mean, even just what feels natural. Yeah. It's, it's not even expecting to see in terms of, I want action. I want to see Bruce Willis sprayed with water. It's <laughs> just even if you isolate it to just that particular sequence yeah. naturally as a viewer watching something on screen it feels like the next shot should be him being pelted with water right. kind of thing and when that doesn't happen that takes you out of the movie where you have yeah. to go oh what happened yeah no i i we're talking about the same thing i think we're just seeing it a little differently mm -hmm. um another example is when he like punches the door off it does eventually show you the door coming off but not at the cut where it would yeah. in like a captain america movie okay. you know um and also there's the fact that everything is not everything obviously but a lot is shot distant and high like a security camera for yeah. reasons that we learn at the end yeah, of the yeah. film that makes sense but that's a frustrating choice until you know why mm -hmm. um I just oh and my number one example of how this movie is kind of a fuck you is I can't even believe the balls on it still again very big spoiler warning drowning David Dunn in a I puddle know. a faceless I goon know. drowns David Dunn in a puddle all these years after people waited to see him come back on screen. That is crazy. That yeah. is so brash and like, I'm not here to make the movie you want. Mm -hmm. I kind of respect it. I, I kind of do. I, I respect it. So the big difference between walking out of glass and walking out of certain other movies that I haven't liked. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to throw Fantastic Beasts under the bus again, but I, <laughs> I have to do it just to paint this picture. To give a contrast. Walked out of that movie, did not like it one bit, and had no desire in this world to ever revisit it. Yeah. Glass, I walked out extremely disappointed, not satisfied, just like you. Yeah, having been bored throughout a good deal of the middle of the movie, Oof. but I genuinely want to see it again. And yeah. I think I want to see it again, even more after going back and forth with certain Collider viewers out there, because I think part of what happened to me while I was watching it, and I said this repeatedly when I was doing all my reviews, that I have a lot of questions. These questions could be answered going back, going back and rewatching it, listening to, in particular, Sarah Paulson's dialogue, but also knowing where the movie ends yeah. and then revisiting it with that different mind frame, with that different lens as the whole story progresses. Because I think certain things are going to come to light for me that made me feel a little empty the first yeah. go around. And one of the examples there is... I think it might have been on the spoiler review, and I refer to the organization that's revealed at the end as nefarious or sinister. And there was one comment that really struck me out there that said, like, no, that's not what they're about. They're, they're trying to change these people. And the only reason that they came out and did what they did is because the horde was posing a real problem for right. them that had to be taken care of. And I think it comes from the tone over overall of the movie and then how the organization was revealed at the end that I mean st I still think that my first viewing I walked out thinking that organization was up to no good they were a group of bad people and it wasn't until that comment came to light in my eyes that I can see it the other way but I still maintain that I did not feel that one bit throughout that entire movie and mm. I do suspect that had that been put in the spotlight a little more I could have had a completely different experience with this film I, I can agree with that. I don't think that I took them as nefarious. I don't think I took them as anything in particular because I don't think that anyone in this film besides maybe David and his, his son have a clear-cut morality. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I didn't look at it that way. I just found it unsatisfying in explanation, mm -hmm. as so much of this film is unsatisfying. And I want to be clear that I don't think that a movie, just because it has balls, doesn't mean it doesn't also kind of suck. Like, there are parts of this that kind of suck. Like, the middle you mentioned it's is boring. a bummer. It's boring. It's and a bummer. We're both huge Sarah Paulson fans. Yeah. I think that was one of the main reasons I was looking forward to this. I was so excited to see her be a main character in the mix with all of these other characters. And I got to say, her character, I don't think it had to do with her performance per se, but the material she was given to work with was... It was it was boring me, yeah. and I think that might be part of the reason why I wasn't super alert, paying attention to every word she uttered, because that character came to feel very repetitive to me, where it was almost like, uh, like what's it called when like it's someone speaking and it puts you to sleep or something, Monotone? and it wrap it like yeah, whatever. But th that's like the effect she had on me, yeah. where it's like every single time she was on screen giving one of her exposition dumps or talking to one of the other characters and trying to talk them into just thinking they didn't have powers and they were human like I just found myself like leaning back more and more and like mm -hmm. sinking into my chair more and more and more I uh I don't disagree with that. I, I love Sarah Paulson. I wish she had more to do. I don't love the choices that were made with this character but um I also don't think that like that's the make or break for the film for me mm -hmm. because there's so much or there should be so much more going on in it than that. I don't know. I very, like I said, I'm so barking through my feelings on this. I, I do think she was the break for me because yeah. one of the things that I've complained about, and I think this also feels even worse coming hot on the heels of, of split yeah. where split. I really do believe that every single moment in that movie has value, whether it's, it's additive value where it builds for the characters or even just an absolutely riveting moment that you can't take your eyes off of. I think every single second in that film is used to good effect. Here, she is the connective tissue between all of the parts. And because I felt every single time I was focused on her, I was, I was getting bored. I was being taken out of the movie. It came across as the movie having no natural transitions ever. It was like it was hot and cold throughout. And I think it's largely because of the way that character is incorporated. And I also think that that, again, affected my overall view of the organization and the film overall, where it, it took away from that reveal significantly for me. I can see that. I, I think that everything surrounding that also doesn't work so well. So it like for example, David and his son, I think for me, like the f unforgettable moment of unbreakable or the moments are the ones that are shared between them and the one in particular is when they're lifting the weights and they both yeah. kind of are like, whoa, this is real. There's nothing like that in this film. Even what it touches on in their relationship is very perfunctory. There's none of that awe or splendor or wonder mm -hmm. or the really any sense of that deep love shared between them, that deep respect. I think that, that it starts off in that way kind of weakly anyway, so if we're not being able to invest in those relationships on the level that we did in the previous films, then yes, you're right, having a, uh, a connective tissue that doesn't work anyway isn't going to help anything, mm -hmm. but I also don't think it starts on the right foot in the first place. Yeah. Also, uh, along the same lines is the, the way that they use James McAvoy in this film, whereas in Split, like you said, it was intentional. Every new personality really, um, he had to change to that to move the story forward. That's not the case here. This is more of just a showcase of mm -hmm. look what he can do. But it could, I, again, I know this is a, a little bit of an issue to say things like this when you're, when you, you know, you express that you wanted the movie yeah. to, to go in a different direction. But I didn't go into this thinking this, but in you describing what you just did, they could have done that sure. in the reverse. And I think that's what they were trying <laughs> to do. So had this been not glass, but split two and focused on the Horde and the Horde's journey the other way, and then maybe incorporating David Dunn as this entity that's going to help facilitate that, that could have been a, another interesting character piece. And I know that wasn't the intention. The whole point was to bring all these characters together and show Glass's influence on them and also yeah. just you know the state of super powered individuals overall but I don't know just in talking about it that seems like it could have been a very interesting and much richer route to take yeah uh, there's a lot of more interesting richer routes yeah. this could have taken I you know 
I don't like at all what they did with Casey. Neither do I. I don't get why she was in the movie, really. I don't, you know. No, I get I get why she was in. But again, this goes back to what I just said. If it was uh, McAvoy's movie, yeah. and it was about him experiencing the reverse right, journey. Right, but I'm talking about the movie that it is. I know. I don't get why I she's know. in it. I know. I'm, I'm there with you. Um, Did it bother you that she looked so different, too? <laughs> that didn't bother me too much, but that's just because teenagers change really quickly, I guess. In three weeks? Yeah. Oh, I, was it really that short? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they <laughs> they specify three weeks that's after that incident. Then. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, just because she, you know, her style was so specific to her and her personality in that. And yeah. I get she went through, like, this very traumatizing experience and came at a different person on Definitely the end. Definitely had a very distinct style in this, but yeah. it's very different. And maybe that was it. Maybe yeah. it was because her fashion was so, it's there. like, it, it popped so yeah. much. I don't know. Um, uh, I wish she had more to do. I love Anya Taylor-Joy. And so do I. I. I regret that, you know, I think that part of, so part of why Unbreakable and Split were so special were the dynamics between these characters and the performances you get out of that. Like the dynamic between Casey and whatever you want to call James McAvoy, the Horde or whatever, yeah. that's what makes Split work. Unbreakable works for me because of that dynamic in the family. Yeah. Uh, we don't really have that here at yeah. all. It's also a little bit of the frustration for me of the movie being called Glass and not really being able to process that it was Glass's movie until, you know, again, just in my opinion, way too late. Yeah. It it also could have been an interesting path to take had it had that superpowered slash non-superpowered individual relationship, but with Glass and maybe somebody else. Mm -hmm. Maybe if, uh, you know, Glass and Sarah Paulson's character, uh, Dr. Staple had a little of that going. I'm, I'm not really sure because one of the most frustrating things about not being super into Glass is there are so many bold moves yeah. that I have a lot of respect for. I think there are some great ideas and great themes peppered throughout this entire thing. It's just a matter of it all not coming together yeah. in in a way that I think was super effective and beneficial for these characters and this this story that M. Night Shyamalan is trying to conclude here. It's a mess. It's a rather spectacular mess, but mm-hmm. it is, in fact, a mess. And I... So, like... The second act is the deal breaker, and what comes with that for me is the the monologue, not monologuing, but the oh, all the explaining comic book stuff. I know people have already talked oh, yeah. that out to death, but like a little too on the nose. Truly, truly hard to take, and genuinely laughable. Like I mean, as in, I laughed. Stuff like that, I think, contributed to why the tone felt super yeah. off to me too. You know, during our screening, there there was a lot of laughter. Yeah. I think some of it was at appropriate moments, probably intended moments, right. where you know James McAvoy was switching gears or something like that. But then others, it was you know loud laughter at lines of dialogue that weren't working. Yeah. Did you know that Metropolis is actually New York City? I think that got the biggest laugh. I think the one that got me the most was when they're like, like, oh, like what what happens when the characters meet in the climax? (laughs) They fight. Yeah. (laughs) They fight. Um, One question I have for you, just, you know, in talking about the big reveal at the end and the organization, because I'm I'm genuinely curious because I'm so thrown off by it. And I'm thrown off by my initial interpretation and also hearing other other interpretations of it. How did you view this organization that Sarah Paulson's character was part of? What were they out to achieve and why did they go about doing that the way they did? I took it at very face value, honestly. Powerful people who don't like other people out there more powerful than them. That's literally what I took it as. That, to me, makes it sound like it's coming from a a negative, dangerous place. No, I don't think so at all. I think it's very neutral, in fact. I think it's saying that... uh, we don't know who these wild card people are. We don't want them changing our world. Um, so it's putting a stop to them. That, like, that's sure, but that doesn't make that bad. If the person they're stopping is the horde, then they're the good guy, right? I think I'm having, given the structure of the story, I think I'm having a very difficult time, though, separating the Horde from Glass and David Dunn. Yeah. Like, looking at the relation, especially looking at the relationship that David Dunn has with his son and what this organization is doing to him, pulling him away from his son and ultimately murdering him. (laughs) Yeah, that's so bad. I, I, like, I can't, I can't. I'm just having a very difficult time looking at this, like people are joking and calling it Hydra, looking at this Hydra in anything but, 
you know, an all powerful manipulative yeah. organization that will kill at the cost of keeping themselves safe. And that to so, me but just you spells also just bad. described a government. So like, it's tricky. I exactly. don't know what the, like, I'm not saying they're good guys. I'm saying that it's a neutral, tricky territory where, yeah. where these, I saw them as power players who held the power and were afraid of other people taking it from him, which is just hmm. to me a very, gen, not generic, but like it's, it's everywhere. It's humanity. That's what we all are. I guess so. I mean, the other, the other question I kept posing and, and some, some commenters did a very good reasonings for this is, is why they held these individuals at the facility. Yeah. It's like if this organization was worried about powerful, super powered individuals overtaking them, why did they even hold glass there? Like, why didn't they just kill them? I think that's maybe part, I, again, I'm thinking about I think this that more goes into now this, than I yeah, ever have. I think that goes into the Sarah Paulson reasoning yeah. that that one person pointed out, which I do think is a very uh, justifiable reason for why they didn't do it. It's just, I need to go back into the movie, see it again with that in mind and actually pinpoint that line and feel it for myself. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's there's probably a lot there that we could take on a second. There's definitely a lot of exposition there that oh we can God, reabsorb yeah. on a second it's viewing. So true, so true. And um, uh, shockingly, I'm I'm eager to do it. I I'm not, really, really am. I am both very interested and dreading it because if I found it boring the first time, I don't know what's going to happen in round two. But I'm yeah. curious, and like I said, I I may not like it, but I kind of respect it. It's a mess, but it's a spectacular mess. It's it's certainly fascinating. It reminds me of kind of like when Ridley Scott does a swing and a miss, like The Counselor, where it's mm. like, oh, that's so weird. I'll allow it. Like I kind <laughs> of like that actually. No, I kind of hear. I I hear you. I thought you were gonna go for uh, Covenant for a minute. Oh, I could see that too. Although I I mostly like Covenant. But it, I, I actually I, was... I flip flop on Covenant. Yeah. Like not to go off the rails here, but. Um, <laughs> I like the parts of Covenant that feel like it's almost trying to recreate the sensation of the original yeah. Alien versus him continuing the stuff he started with David and Prometheus. So I like both of them. I just don't think they belong in the same movie. That's a fair point, too. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, so it, that's another, that's a good call, another spectacular mess, although I think Covenant is better than Glass. Mm -hmm. I'll, yes, I'll, you can, I will definitely agree with I'll that as well. I'll stand on that hill. Yeah, <laughs> or yeah. what is it, die on the hill? God, I don't want to die on I the hill. I don't know. You, you could stand on the hill. Okay. <laughs> Do you. I'll wave my um, little flag on the hill. One random shout out, just because I'm looking at his name right now, and he stood out to me in the movie, Luke Kirby, who I am just loving in Marvelous Mrs. Maisel right now. I don't really think he got, you know, it's it's not the kind of character that you're rooting for because he's, he's not the greatest guy in the world, but I will say that anytime he was on screen in that in the you know security guard nurse role he was one of two guys that i mean that's the other thing too it's like if you are working in a facility housing people with superhuman <laughs> abilities why do you have two guys switching off shifts it's there i don't understand don't understand especially the organization like, is not very good apparently you're powered by a whole yeah. bunch of rich people yeah. hire more but anyway know. he is just somebody that i keep looking yeah. out for now and i do think it's a very similar thing with um with him and who are we talking about in in you oh harry neff yeah. where anytime he's on screen there's something about his, his personality his charm his charisma his on-screen presence that will always kind of like draw my eye to him it took me a minute to figure out who you're talking about because um, I do not watch Miss Maisel, but I did know Highly his recommended. name. <laughs> really? I haven't heard anyone say it's good. <laughs> I know. Um, he was on Rectify, and he was phenomenal yeah. on that show, as was everybody on that show. So, yes, I do now know why I recognize him, and he is good, and I agree. Why would you have these two morons trading shifts at your Fancy Pants superhero <laughs> facility? Yeah, yeah. Bunch of... Bunch of questions there. Bunch of um, questions that Shyamalan has no interest in answering. I don't. I don't know. I mean, hasn't he said like, "Nope, I'm done. That's what you're I getting." Guess, no, I guess so. But it's like, didn't Steve uh, do the interview with him and uh, like his original cut was like three plus hours or oh, something? I, I didn't read that. That's interesting. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure he did the junket interview with him and and Shyamalan said something along those lines. So perhaps okay. you know the details are there in scenes that got hey. cut. This could be an interesting one to keep an eye out for DVD and Blu-ray special yeah. features to see what was added and to see what was removed from the final cut. So I'm curious. But 
But I guess that's it. Is there anything that's... else you want to add before we wrap this up? Uh, no, it's it's fun, though. It's been fun doing, like, these reviews. I, we had a, a long series of great guests, and I feel yeah. like we haven't had to keep had time to really keep up with our pop culture lately. It's true, true. It's yeah. nice to have this opportunity. And, you know, also, uh, when we get, when I get back, so our, our next episode, just to tease it a little, we mm. have a wonderful guest, uh, one of my favorite people on this planet. Yes. And it's, uh, it's Matt Donato, who is a very prolific horror film critic. And and a good dude. He really is. And he joins us for an episode that's pretty much all about uh, Final Destination, <laughs> yeah. which obviously thrills me to no end. But the episode after that will be my first episode back from Sundance. And I hope I have a whole bunch of yeah. wonderful upcoming horror releases to tell you about. I've, I've got sky high hopes, just to tease one, that two that I've got my eye on right now. Uh, the Hole in the Ground from A24. We all know how hereditary went for them at Sundance last mm -hmm. year, so they've got that this year. And then also there's a Lupita Nyong'o zombie movie called Little Monsters yeah. that I know I have a ticket to, and... Boy, I can't wait for that one. I'm really curious about that one. That director, Abe Forsyth, he did a comedy, a very pitch black comedy last, not last year, in 2016 called um, Down Under that took place during like a race riot oh. and was still somehow funny while also being just genuinely so violent and oh dark. So I'm Maybe I should very seek that curious. Out before I see it. Is there anything else from Sundance that's on your radar that I should make sure I don't miss? Those were actually the two that I yeah. was really looking out for. Have you seen the direct, uh, I think his name is Lee Cronin, the directors of, uh, the director of uh, The Hole in the Ground, his short film, Ghost Train? No, I have not. Go Google Ghost okay. Train and watch it. It... <laughs> I, it, it gives me it vibes a little Ooh. bit with the way that it plays with, uh, you know, different points in your life. But it's it's also just like a beautifully shot piece. And I think this idea of the ghost train is so wonderfully cinematic. And I almost wish he would adapt that into a feature. I don't know if he has any interest in doing so, but I'm curious to see what he does with his feature directorial debut because I love that short so much. Of course, it's hole in the ground. I will tell you all about yeah. it when I get back. I did but just think of two more, actually. Let's hear it. I lied. Uh, wounds with I have a, Hammer and Dakota, I have a ticket to Wounds, who I adore both of them, and um, the the Alien documentary. I because... believe Matt is reviewing that one, Fair so enough. I think I'm out on that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I believe that's the first the first uh, item on the horror on the midnight lineup there that's oh, awesome. going to screen. So I think it's the first Thursday of the festival. It's the uh, the same guy who did that. Oh, what's the ratio? It's the Psycho documentary about the shower oh. scene. Um, yeah, I know what that something is. Something 52. I'm so sorry, dude. We should know that. I know. Uh, oh, but, I'm not going to think about it. But yeah, he made one about Alien, and I'm very excited to yeah, see it. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious to see how that one that one does as well, and I'll get the full report from Matt on Thursday night. Yes. Uh, so that's it. We're done We're done with this episode of The Witching Hour. We did all the things. Yeah, we did all the things. Um, yet another thing that I'm going to repeat, just because we are here and we can, and I think it's well worth it. If you like glass, good for you. If you don't like glass, good for you. Let's have a constructive conversation yeah. about your thoughts in the comment section below. Be kind. There is a very kind way to share your opinion, whether or not you agree with what we said or with what somebody else in the comment section say. So let's celebrate movies together and have good conversations that way. Thank you guys so much for watching and or listening to this episode of The Witching Hour. Haley, where can everyone find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, and I just want to, like, forgot that this is now a, a white pride thing. So I was just saying, okay, don't be cruel. Oh. I wasn't being weird or creepy. I yeah. think I learned that when we all did Gucci yeah. okay. at the end of our uh, our eighth grade video. I had, I, I just had no always that forget, was a and I'm, either. I'm an old school person. I'm yeah. like, okay, wait, no. So, yeah, yeah you know. can find me on Twitter not being white pride at Haley Fouch, <laughs> and you can find me on Instagram at Haystack McGroovy, where, again, I am not a white supremacist. <laughs> Good thing you clarified. Yes. Um, you can catch me on Twitter and Instagram, at PNMROF, and also keep an eye on Collider.com, because through my stretch at Sundance, I will be doing written reviews, a number of them, for the website. We're going to have a whole bunch of great interviews. Can't I'm going to be tweeting and Instagramming like crazy, so keep an eye on all that. Thank you again for supporting this show. We love you. You have officially survived the witch hour.